Well, it, it's just a pleasure to be involved with programming at the University of Arizona, where there's a really uh, excellent lineage of Afghanistan uh, programmatic attention in so many ways. So um, I think this is a really important and opportune time um, to have this discussion with you. I'm really pleased uh, to be speaking to K through 12 educators. You lay the foundation for what we do at universities and uh, on behalf of the professoriate, you know, thank you for all you do to prepare students uh, for us. Um, but let, I think it's important to take stock of our moment that is in the United States in schools where there is a, a considerable bit of contention on history, on history, how it's taught, what you can read, what categories, what vocabulary um, can be used to study history. This is a really um, now politicized domain, um, but an important one. And uh, I'd like to try to position um, Afghan refugees um, in, in a way that connects that experience of Afghan refugees and global refugees to our kind of current uh, curricular, uh, de the demands uh, that the curriculum uh, places upon us now. So where do refugees come from? If it's war, where do wars come from? If it's economic conditions, what are those? What are the climactic factors? And generally, um, it's very important for us to think through the uh, history of, human mobility to understand Afghanistan. Afghanistan has a history kind of, of refugee reception and production. It turns out if we look at the deep, uh, the, the deep past. And let me say that also by way of a kind of final introductory comment. Um, Afghanistan has been around since human uh, history has been around. It, it is it, episodically a part of a lot of different global histories but Afghanistan itself has not really cultivated historical studies. I've used the phrase that Afghanistan has a deep past, but a shallow history. And one thing that I would like to uh, strive for is that as you start to encounter more Afghan students in your classes, to position their experience in relationship to our United States curricular experience now, but also cultivate an interest in them about their own um, homeland history. I would just uh, be elated to see more Afghan people, heritage students, people born in Afghanistan and raised there, taking a deeper historical interest in, in the place we share. So um, broadly, I wanna do um, some attention to the Pre-modern era, it's so very important for understanding um, global mobility patterns of which current refugees are an expression. I'd like to touch very quickly on the modern state system as it sort of constructed Afghanistan through British colonialism, then jump in a more, um, uh, again, very cursory way to the United States encounter with Afghanistan, a really kind of consistent encounter between the, the, from the Cold War until today, as you know. And once again, the overall thrust of this um, is to consider the Afghan refugee experience as a part of um, uh, a larger set of very interesting issues that we're reckoning with in the academy. Okay, so I'll try to get a laser pointer here. And this is a summation of what a number of the links that were sent around um, discuss. Um, the links tend to focus <laughs> on, on empires. And I just wanna go through a, a little bit of, of this kind of uh, imperial history. And it's important to frame the United States as an imperial formation to understand its global projections and the production of wars and refugees that are kind of contextualizing our our encounter here today. So um, Afghanistan has been a big part of the, the kind of archeological record 
um, really deep Neolithic kind of technologies, the agricultural revolution, Af Afghanistan's a part of that literature. So I wanna be sure to position Afghanistan geographically, that is historically bounded by the Indus River, which you can see, I hope my cursor moving, the Amu Darya or Oxus River on the Northern um, sort of boundary of Afghanistan. And then the central Hindu Kush mountain spine, which is a part of the greater Himalayan uh, mountain chain. And those three geographic elements really help us understand uh, ancient empires and cultural connections. The Alexander the Great uh, sort of period in the about you know, third century BC roughly has generated a lot of attention, a lot of attention for urban uh, sort of city formation, a lot of archeology span in that regard, but a great deal of artistic exchange, sort of Eastern Mediterranean aesthetics make their way into the Peshawar and Kabul valleys uh, with a lot of ancient sculpture. Um, that's a sort of great subject matter in its own right for students. This period that I've captured here with Buddhism and Hinduism highlight the multi-religious history of this region. It has been indeed not just a center of multiple religions and indeed, as you know, Buddhism uh, as a global center of Buddhism for maybe the sixth uh, through the ninth centuries roughly. Those Bamiyan Buddhas that were uh, destroyed by Al-Qaeda before 9-11, you may know about that. But I'd like to turn to the em Islamic empires particularly the Ghaznavid Empire, centered on the Eastern Afghan city of Ghazni, Ghazna historically, thus the Ghaznavids, uh, in about 1000 AD. This is such a significant uh, moment for the geographic space of Afghanistan, because this begins the Islamization of South Asia in a concerted way, in a way that brought people from the space of Afghanistan into North India. And Islam generated a new set of mobility patterns through Afghanistan, sustained mobility patterns that highlight the cultural mixing, the religious mixing, the linguistic mixing that characterize um, the pre-modern period here, geographic Afghanistan. It's very important to remember everything we've discussed up until this point, and even further, is a borderless world, no borders. And that is so important for Afghanistan as a corridor of communication. The Ghaznavid Empire is most important for developing modern Persian, the Persian language as we know it in today, that is written with the Arabic script is sort of a consequence of the Ghaznavid Empire in Eastern Afghanistan. The early modern empires of the Mughals, Safavids, and Ottomans often characterized as the gunpowder empires um, involve Afghanistan heavily, particularly the Safavid empire in Iran, the Mughal empire in India um, kind of competed over the space of Afghanistan. The founder of the Mughal empire, the Indian empire is buried in Kabul. His name is Babur. His memoirs are in English and they're a uh, kind of a love story about the environment of Kabul, the gardens, the waters, the rivers, the plants, the animals, the mountains. And it's available in English um, for you. The kind of political history of the thing we know as Afghanistan um, is, uh, begins after um, the Mughal and Safavid empires begin to fragment and kind of um, uh, disappear. And that foundation of the Afghan polity um, is done in the mid 18th century by a figure named Ahmad Shah Abdali, who changes his name to Durrani highlighting some of the identity politics, the linguistic politics, the religious politics involved in all of uh, these political affairs. The important thing is that that's a mobile empire. 
It's still an empire that's got a mobile court invading and circulating to and through India. I think 14 times Ahmad Shah invaded India, a pattern established 800 years earlier, roughly, uh, by the Ghaznavids. So the secondary point here is that that capital city, insofar as there was one, was in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Ahmad Shah's son in the late 18th century moves the capital to Kabul. This is very consequential. The history of relations between Kabul and Kandahar is an important thematic to think about. There's a lot of tension actually between those um, spaces, the Taliban kind of spiritual home uh, being Kandahar and sort of conquering Kabul as a uh, um, uh, very different sort of uh, relationship. So the point here is that uh, Kabul becomes the capital right when the British are getting interested in South Asia, in the Indus River in particular, in the passes through the Himalayas and Hindu Kush in particular. And the British encounter with Afghanistan comes through Kabul and it's the British um, uh, treaty signed with the ruler of Kabul in 1809 that begins the British relationship with this space that's still not called Afghanistan. Their British relationship involves two wars in 1839 and 42, which is the catastrophic um, imperial um, disaster where all, uh, all the entire army was massacred. And there were some hostages taken and it's a complex story, but an imperial um, scar. So very important for setting the kind of template of, of, of rebellious Muslim tribes that begin to characterize the colonial um, discursive formation of the people of Afghanistan as recalcitrant Muslims, tribal peoples, xenophobic peoples. And these are Orientalist characterizations, kind of uh, Orientalism meaning a, a, a set of uh, cultural categories that are replete with political biases and imperial sort of context about them. The second Afghan war um, ends without a disaster for the British, but a um, uh, important set of structural developments here. The British sort of withdraw their forces before they are um, really under great military threat in the second Afghan war of 1878 to 80. But upon leaving the country, they leave now a very, um, let's call this person a, an appointed ruler. Some may say a local puppet ruler, but this ruler named Abdul Rahman begins to get considerable British subsidies. A lot of the money for those subsidies are bought are spent buying British machinery to develop a sort of uh, local industrial complex, to build weapons primarily, to be used against the people of Afghanistan primarily in the Hazarajat, Central Highlands, and in Nuristan, the uh, Hindu Kush Eastern, Northeastern mountain zone. This is sometimes called internal colonialism, but it was a brutal and violent affair that left a great distance between the Afghan state and Afghan society that began the structural dependency of Afghan rulers on external financial and military assistance. And more importantly, it's during Abdurrahman's period that the final bordering of Afghanistan as we know it today as a bounded space takes shape during this colonial period during the late 19th century. Afghanistan's borders are entirely British and indeed Russian and Ottoman sort of constructions. And that's very important that the borders of Afghanistan were in principle primarily um, created through imperial actions. And that changes the mobility patterns through that space. This begins Afghanistan's economic decline. It's sort of um, 
uh, economic isolation in some, in some ways that's very new and different from the deeper history we've discussed previously. Very consequential. Very consequential that the third war of 1919 is often called the war of independence. But the question is independence from what? And it really, independence really speaks to a colonial set of dependencies, okay? Now, it's not really a war of 1919, it's fundamentally one aerial bombardment of Kabul and the airplane, an aerial bombing of Pashto speaking tribes in British India and Kabul. This is a very important, uh, the beginning of a very sad uh, kind of bombing history in Afghanistan, tragic. But what is important about 1919 is that now independent Afghan rulers can deal with the world without British mediation. And independence therefore opens the doors to all kinds of new global actors, including Americans, Russian, French, Germans, later on, even Asian, Japanese, Chinese. It's so important that that moment of independence really generates new connections and ultimately new dependencies for the political elite in Kabul. The really interesting thing is that independence sort of generates a relationship between these Afghan rulers and the outside world that further distances these rulers who often have ties to the outside world through their own experience as migrants. It's such an important uh, sort of thing that there's a jumping of scale, so to speak. Independent Afghan rulers look to the outer world, not internal local cultural resources. Okay, so I'm gonna jump now to the American period. That is after World War II and the final part of this. And there's a lot of, this is a montage of a company magazine, the Morrison Knutson Company, who's associated with major construction projects in the United States, the Hoover Dam, near you, Golden Gate Bridge. And globally, Morrison Knutson uh, Company um, was an agent of US development policy around the world in Southeast Asia, Afghanistan, Africa, South America. So really significant. Um, development begins to be used as a foreign policy tool in beginning in the 40s and 50s. And Afghanistan gets really sort of wrapped up in US development aid. Aid for a large scale hydroelectric damming complex in the south of the country, the Helmand Valley Development Project. This is so significant for intensifying relationships between the United States and Afghanistan. In addition to just the development activities in Afghanistan, there's a series of educational and technical exchanges. The, 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 my father, ends up studying in the United States because of education programs associated with the Helmand. Hundreds, thousands of Afghans ultimately um, uh, get exposed to the development location. So it's not just the United States, but all over the world, uh, the governments that are funding development projects. And there's the Soviets, Americans, the Germans are doing forestry, Japanese doing archeology. span those projects generate relationships and exchange that are so important to understanding um, uh, the beginning of intense US relationships with Afghanistan. And the, the problem with this dam and this project is that it was based on bad science. The irrigation uh, sort of uh, dream did not get realized. The salinization of the soil is a major consequence and thus the opium production that Afghanistan is known for is centered in this region of failed US development. So important geographically. This is a montage of the Afghan Mujahideen. And it's important, so important to remember that everything in terms of development was public policy. The public knew about it. It involved, um, again, public educational exchanges like the Fulbright program. Now, that overt sort of development policy must be understood after the Soviet invasion, 
with an extensive covert set of relationships between the United States government through the CIA and the Afghan Mujahideen, beginning actually in 1979 and intensifying through the 80s, a real, the largest covert operation in United States history generated some significant relationships between the United States and Afghanistan. The generation, the production of Afghan refugees, the world's largest refugee population is associated with this period of the Soviet invasion, the American response, and then the Soviet departure and the sort of interregnum um, of American engagement with the Mujahideen. The important thing here is that this was really a very difficult period for Afghans as a whole. Afghan society um, sort of imploded in many ways here. And the Taliban emerged out of this period. The Taliban uh, the, emerged literally out of the Mujahideen. We must appreciate that. We must historically appreciate that. We must historically appreciate the relationship between US foreign uh, public policy and covert policy. And the sort of production of new kinds of global migrations and human movements. The Afghan Jihad became a global sort of Muslim cause with enormous consequences resulting, you know, with Arabs being the perpetrators of 9-11, not a single Afghan on any of those 9-11 planes, Arabs. But sort of connected to Afghans and of course the Osama bin Laden thing. Now, um, the 20 year period of American uh, presence in Afghanistan um, involves a lot of uh, public sphere production, a lot of focus on education, girls schools, et cetera, on the public side of things, but particularly on the covert side of things, a really intense drone war, a lot of real, uh, very difficult things for the Afghan people. And we're talking about night raids, abductions, the assassinations and the torture regime associated with Abu Ghraib in Iraq most publicly, but really it's a Guantanamo Bay, it's in that net. And Afghanistan, Bagram bases associated with this set of covert operations. And we must appreciate this as US citizens that we pay for this stuff. And the idea is that citizen transparency, democracy, we're supposed to know where our money goes. With covert operations, it's very hard to track what's happening. And combined, both the public, uh, let's call it public sphere, particularly in Kabul, developments that attract most of the media coverage, however problematic in most recent August, this August period, very problematic, of course. But we cannot think about Afghanistan through Kabul alone. It's actually quite misleading to, to do that um, as, as, as students and scholars. And the things that are kind of uh, happening in Kabul certainly involve a lot of great developments with education and art, for example, but also a really difficult growth of, of, a, of a really lower class, a lot of sort of homelessness, drug use, prostitution. The pollution in Kabul is extreme. One of the most polluted cities in the world because of military vehicles. The carbon footprint of the military has affected the economy. Um, in so many ways, the environment is affected by war. That's what I'd like to put forth as, a, as educators. And um, then the question becomes, how do we understand history? Why is history in the United States so contention? Let's reduce it to racial questions, questions of slavery. The, the historical residue of slavery in the United States is the point of contention. I hope we can uh, generally, whatever we can agree that that's, where the state's intruding on our class conduct over those issues. In Afghanistan, the issue is actually quite racialized as well. And it's under the guise of ethnicity. And so we need to be really um, attentive to the ethnic labels and the sort of their use as othering devices in the discourse of Afghanistan. And it's very challenging to do that because Afghans ourselves have adopted and rely on those categories and they're not inauthentic, but we need to be critically attentive to what they're representing. And with Afghanistan um, associating 
linguistic identities, with ethnic identities. So a Pashto speaker, for example, versus a Dari or Persian speaker, sort of insinuating ethnic distinctions there is, um, can be quite misleading because of two factors. The first being multilingualism. Afghanistan is a multilingual environment. I'll wrap up in 30 seconds. Five minutes. How many? Five minutes. Well, I'm elated to have such an, a, a, a little bit more time to highlight that multilingualism is one feature of the mobility and the cultural interactions that form the historical background for Afghanistan. Multilingualism explains a lot of the current refugees insofar as a lot of them are associated with in being interpreters and translators. We can assume and we must assume, and when we look at the production of Afghan refugees in the United States, the 1980s and 90s produced hundreds of thousands as well in California, in Northern Virginia, That is associated with the Soviet war, okay? And maybe um, in, in a number, we need to now position the current inward flow of Afghan refugees. Where do they come from? Well, again, it's another war, it's the American war, but these are largely, I don't know if it's exclusively, but kind of associated with the, that projection of United States power that imperial projection of power. And so there is a kind of political factor in the production of refugees and management of refugees. In that sense, we must be attentive to the fact that a lot of the Afghan refugees are coming with that um, sort of political perspective on the United States, on themselves and their relationship, militarized, politicized, ethnicized in many ways. But what I hope we can generate together as educators with students is to think about the complexity of these relationships historically and culturally. Is it values or languages that allow for these communications? And historically, um, um, empires and, and those whom they rely upon the translators, interpreters, informants that all empires must rely on when they do their imperial activity abroad. It's a very interesting layer to think through analytically um, as we understand how Afghanistan's history has been constructed in many ways with externalities, external empires, imperial projections, wars, and the relationships and mobility patterns associated with them historically. Um, uh, the, the, the most significant thing is we don't wanna reduce Afghanistan to single issues, single languages. Um, my hope is that in trying to complexify the history and culture, it opens up more questions really than answers. I consider myself a student of Afghanistan and not someone who has total knowledge of, of this. Um, and it's important that we, we think about this objectively um, in dialogue with the, um, in particular, the Afghan students that will be, um, you'll be working with and sending them on hopefully to us. I am um, delighted to, um, to just talk about some practical aspect of Afghanistan culture. I, I know Professor Ranifi eloquently talked about the pre-modern era and the history and geography of Afghanistan, but I'm just gonna try to talk about very few elements of culture uh, that would be beneficial to those of you that they're dealing with Afghans and Afghan refugees coming to the United States. Uh, the culture of Afghanistan, as you heard from Professor Anifi, has persisted over three millennia tracing back to 500 BCE. The uh, modern nation of Afghanistan, as we heard before, uh, is emerged during the 18th century by Pashtun tribe 
of Durrani in reaction to the decline of Persian in Indian Empire. Afghanistan crossroad position in Central Asia has uh, subjected to its constant invasion and conquest through its long recorded history, the history of Afghanistan. And, and we heard it from Professor Anifi's history of war and conflict even up to this moment. Afghanistan population, according to the CIA World, uh, World Factbook um, of July 2021 is a little over 37 million people. It's a landlocked country in South Asia. Its capital and largest city is Kabul. Pashto and Dari are its official languages. Uh, by the way, Kabul's population is around six to seven million inhabitants. So the size of the city is the same size as of Albuquerque. Imagine the crowdness of that city. Um, climate is arid and semi-arid, cold in the winter times and hot in the summertime. The literacy rate is very high in Afghanistan, especially um, among those over the age of 15. There's a, about 37.3% of uh, people are only uh, can read and write, uh, of which 52.1% are male and 22.6% are female. So when you're getting these families coming in from Afghanistan, your likelihood to run into some of the, uh, especially the women that they have not had any chances to go to school. So they, they will not be much of a help to their kids as well. The name Afghan originally referred to the Pashtun people. Today it's understood to include all of the Afghan ethnic groups. While the suffix stan mean place of or country. So Afghanistan literally means the land of the Afghans. Now, I want to talk about some of the major elements and characteristics of Afghan culture. Um, Afghan culture have, have gone through a major transformation, especially in urban areas from the 60s, 70s, and 80s due to war, conflicts, unrest, and displacement and migration. However, the core concepts and cultural values are still applicable and remain strong among ethnic groups in the country. The core characteristics, as they want to call it themselves, include resiliency, stoicism, independency, loyalty, tri tribalism, honor, compassion, and hospitality. Major elements of culture first includes marriage, family, and kinship. One's family is the single most important aspect of life in Afghanistan. Afghan culture is very collectivistic, emphasis on the needs and goals of the group rather than the needs of the individual. And people generally put their family interests before their own. Throughout all Afghanistan, family matters are kept strictly private. People are often reluctant to share personal issues with non-family members. Much social behavior is influenced by Afghans' awareness of their personal honor, and honor in this sense encompasses an individual's reputation, prestige, and worth. As a member of a collectivist society, most Afghans consider a person's behavior to be reflective of their family, tribe, or ethnicity that they belong to. Thus, when a person's behavior is perceived to be dishonorable, their family shares the shame. The senior member of family is always responsible for protecting the honor of the family. Afghan household families are very large and multi-generational. It's customary for a woman to move in with their husband's family at the time when they get married. Uh, the average size of Afghan households is around 7.8. That includes a husband, a wife, their sons, unmarried sons and daughters, and their sons, um, spouse, and children. It also includes an extended family household, like a three or four generation may live together. You'll see some of that when the refugees coming, that you'll, you'll see them at uh, very large extended families. And in fact, we're having problem finding homes in the Tucson area for families 
that they're coming in because apartments are not able to accommodate them. Family ro rules vary, um, vary between ethnicities, socioeconomic status, and regions. Nevertheless, a traditional patriarchal age hierarchy prevails throughout uh, all of that. Eldest male has the most authority in decision-making and usually controls all family spending. Every decision must be approved by the house, by the, by the husband or the father, um, unless there is no father in the family. Children are to, are to show uh, reverence and differences to their parents and elders. That includes teachers as well. Disobedience of an elder's word is seen as extremely disrespectful. The Afghan education system is, is, is somewhat limited. Um, especially for those living in, in the rural areas. Many Af young children learn entirely from a village or a mosque or religious leaders known as the mullah uh, or their parents. Um, also, as I have to point out that even your um, uh, student in a higher level like uh, uh, high school, they have not had any sex education incorporated in their, um, in their curriculum. Uh, subjects that they are emphasized are more strong or sciences area, but social sciences and humanities, there's a lot of limitations. And, and you may have students coming in on the high school level that they've had some English, um, but elementary and, um, and secondary school students are really in strong need of English language classes. So I just want to emphasize that. Gender, Rules are highly patriarchal and rigidly defined in Afghan culture. The men are viewed as the main income earners and the women are seen as the, the homemaker. But that's gonna change when they come to this society because I've seen them the other way around. Separation of genders are, are common. The, most Afghans um, observe a public separation of the genders that's legally enforced in some cases, mixing, of males and females are only occurring within family or closely knit um, village communities. Even in here in Tucson, Arizona, when the Afghans are getting together, the men and women are often separated from each other. Marriage is considered an essential component of life in Afghanistan, and all relationships are, present, um, are presumed to lead to marriage. Dating is not allowed, especially for girls. Dating is almost totally limited to getting to know the person's one who most likely to marry and usually occurs in the company of others, such as family members. People tend to marry within their tribe or ethnic group. Strong consideration is also given to the prospective spouse status, network, wealth, and family background. Marriage can be a means to broaden a family's access to resources or, in some cases, resolve disputes. Marriage is also considered an obligation, and divorce is rare and stigmatized. Polygamy is allowed if all wives are treated equally. Um, however, polygamy occurs primarily when a man feels obligated to marry the widow of his dead brother. Uh, the general pattern is to marry kin, although families try to diversify their social assets through marriage. All groups trace their ancestors through male line. Each tribal group uh, claims a common male ancestors and is divided into sub tribes, clans, and families. I, I just want to add something to this is that they cannot bring a multiple wives to the United States. Oftentimes you see families bringing their wives. Uh, the second wife is, a, is a, another member of the family. So, so some kids may have their stepmother, but they do not want to reveal that that's their stepmother. Um, but also another factor is that in Afghan culture, it's common to marry your first cousin. Where in the United States, uh, in most of the states, you cannot do that. We had some families here in, the, in Arizona that the couple were uh, cousins and they were trying to get married and they had to go through the, the immigration process, but they could not live in Arizona. So they had to move either to New Mexico or to California. 
So if you are working with students that their parents' marriage certificate says they're uh, first cousins, you need to be aware of that. And there are some uh, legal issues and some issues that they need to work out before going through the immigration process. Women are brutalized by tribal customs by settling disputes known as bod, um, which treat young girls as voiceless commodities in Afghanistan. Um, they are offered in compensation to another family, often to an elderly man uh, or unpaid debt or a member of that family that has been killed by a relative of the girl. Again, seeing refugees coming from Afghanistan in likelihood you'll see a lot of a lot of women being very young and a husband uh, be a little bit much older than them. On the wider issue of gender rights, the Taliban are rightly accused of relegating women, Afghan women to a second uh, class citizenship, but to single out the Taliban out is uniquely oppressive is not quite accurate. Violence against women has a long pedigree in all communities among most ethnic groups in Afghanistan. And the marriage is common across Afghanistan and among all ethnic groups. According to the United Nations Development Fund for Women and the Afghan Independent Human Rights Com Commission, uh, about 57% of Afghan marriages are child marriages uh, where one partner is under the age of 16. But there's a recent data that I just got today from UNICEF, and they're very concerned about the, the young uh, girls being forced to be marrying the older men. They're saying 20, it's risen to 28% for uh, people under uh, age 18. And there's, uh, these are the group, um, group between 15 and 49 ages. So there is, there is that happening, especially now that the girls are not able to go to schools. Um, the second part of the culture, an important element is religion. Uh, Professor Anifi touched on that, but the culture of Afghanistan is uh, influenced by religion, especially by Islam. Islam is the official religion of Afghanistan, and most of the population is Muslim, approximately 99.7%. There are some other small residual communities um, of other faith, including Christian, Sikhs, Hindus, and Baha'i, um, but again, a majority are Muslim. And, and the Muslim uh, population adheres to Sunni Islam, um, while an estimated of about only seven to 15% practice Shia Islam, or approximately 1% is, is uh, followers of other religion. Afghanistan has a strong Hindu in Buddhist heritage, you heard from Professor Anafi, uh, from the ancient era. However, the numbers of minority Muslim and non-Muslim groups have significantly declined over the past decades as people have fled sectarian tensions and conflict. The Afghan government is established as a Sunni Islamic government. Therefore, there is a strong societal pressure to adhere to Sunni Islamic tradition. Statistical estimation of each Muslim denomination size in Afghanistan are unclear. Afghanistan has a struggle, a struggled with sectarian tensions between its Sunni and Shia population. Sunni denominated governments have histories of discrimination against minority Shia. Both the Taliban and ISIS radicalized Sunni terrorist insurgency groups continue to target and kill members of the minority religious communities over their beliefs. They often attack Shia places of, uh, of worship or religious ceremonies, civilian casualties resulting from attacks deliberately targeting Shia mullahs or places of worship has increased marketably since 2016, especially. The Azara Shia population is generally the most common victim of ethno-religious terrorism groups. An Afghan that feels discontent with their religion may not make their thoughts and beliefs known to their family or community, showing contempt, offensive, or a lack of reverence towards Islam can be considered blasphemous. 
So you you might be aware of the high school students. Sometimes they may disagree with their parents, but it's hard for them to discuss that with their parents uh, in open um, conversation. Such laws and penalties surrounding blasphemies and apostasy from Islam has been used to harass religious minorities, especially um, journalists can also be targeted for publishing um, stories that could be perceived as conflicting with the principle of Islam. Uh, mosques are uh, uh, holy places for Afghan. It's, uh, they play an important role in the social life of the village communities and the local identities. Even Afghans here, they, they tend to be attending mosques, especially um, on Friday for Friday prayers. Uh, but in Afghanistan, most villages have a place to pray, but they also accommodate uh, travelers. An important figure in Muslim life is, of course, Mullah. Um, he's a religious man you know, or a teacher. Any man who can recite Quran uh, from memory can be a Mullah. A Mullah also conducts Friday sermon, prayers, marriages, and funerals. Friday is uh, the holy day for Muslim, it's a holiday. And in Afghanistan, most businesses close on that day and plus half of the Thursday. So that means the weekend falls on Thursday and Friday instead of Saturday and Sunday. Uh, deaths are buried rapidly uh, after they, they die in, in Afghanistan. And also here, they try to do that if, if they can. Um, but for three days, the close relatives of deceased open their house to receive condolences. So uh, that's something your students uh, may be encountering students to be uh, attending condolences for several days for the death of their families. The third element of culture is ethnicity. I think again, Professor Anifi eloquently talked about that. But once ethnicity is an instant culture identifier in Afghanistan, and usually defines people's social organization. There are as many as 14 recognized ethnic groups according to Afghanistan a constitution. Pashtuns are the largest followed by the Tajiks and then Azara, Uzbek, et cetera. Current statistical data on a sensitive subject of ethnicity in Afghanistan are not available. And ethnicity data from small samples of respondents to opinion polls are not reliable um, alternatives. The fourth element of uh, culture is tribe. Afghanistan is mostly a tribal society with different regions of the country having its own subculture. Nearly all Afghans follow Islamic tradition, celebrate the same holidays, more or less dress the same, consume or more or less the same food, listen to the music, and they are multilingual to a certain extent. Within many ethnic groups, there are long-standing tribal clans formed through kinship. These tribes often live as local communities in the villages. And most tribes inherit the land in means of production from their ancestors. Some Afghan affiliation to their tribes have been disrupted. This conflict has forced people to prioritize their individual family survival. However, those who have remained connected and united with their tribe continue to be extremely loyal to their tribes, but secondary to their obligation to their family. Over the centuries, rival tribal groups have constantly competed over rights to land, resources, power, and even women. This has endangered a competitive spirit in Afghan culture and has been the cause of a great deal of recurrent violence and disharmony between tribes and ethnicities. The fifth element, in my opinion, the culture is the culture identity. Again, Professor Anifi touched on that, but the relentless conflict of the 2020 century has produced generations of Afghan who have um, really experienced peace. Consequently, many Afghans think of themselves as survivors. 
Further, people are often mostly strong to outside interference in internal politics. This has translated into a prevailing national attitude that strongly favors independence from controlling bodies. However, the assertion of the country's independence has not necessarily resulted um, in national cohesiveness. Afghans tend to hold a stronger sense of loyalty for their kin, tribe, or ethnicity than their national identity. Over 60% of the Afghan populations are under the age of 25. This young age um, structure reflects the impact of decades of conflict, widespread poverty, political instability, displacement, and the lack of substantial infrastructure. There's a couple of uh, things I want to mention to be considering uh, understanding the Afghan cultures, and these are some pointers. Afghani refers to currency, not to, to the Afghan people. Uh, burqa existed in Afghanistan way before the Taliban rise of power, um, but there are, uh, but of course, the Taliban enforced a policy that required women to wear burqa when they go out outside of their home. Some liberal women still uh, may prefer not to wear burqa, but they still wear some kind of scarf to cover their head. And you see that among the Afghan women here in the United States or among some of them. I consider that some individual may be illiterate and require an interpreter to assist them in reading materials. Literacy level is very depending on which region of Afghanistan a person has come from, as well as their migration journey. Um, one thing I wanna mention that um, I think one of the uh, major thing that the Afghan kids are gonna be responsible as they come here is the refugee, their uh, role get reversed. In fact, they become an interpreter, translator for their parents because they quickly learn the language and they quickly get integrated into the society. So they often become the eyes and ears of their own parents. Uh, most Afghan women are not taught how to drive. And when even the men they're coming here, they don't have a valid driver's license. So they may depend on others to transport them to different locations. Young people address elders not by name, but by, by title. Family surnames are not uh, uh, are, are unusual, but nicknames are very common. Kinship terms often are used to express friendship or respect. Hospitality is, of course, uh, a strong cultural value in among Afghan people. The common Islamic food prohibitions are respected in Afghanistan. For example, meat is only eaten from animals that are slaughtered according to Islamic law, alcohol, pork, and wild boar are not consumed. Be sensitive to the experiences that the Afghan refugees have been endured. There's a high occurrences of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder among those that have witnessed the loss of their family and friends. Many Afghans that have fled to Western countries have had their entire home village destroyed by the Taliban or other forces and do not possess any memorable personal items. Do not call Afghans Arab or Middle Eastern. Afghanistan is not located in the Middle East. It's a South Central Asian country composed of many different ethnicities, none of which are Arab. Do not assume that all Afghan Muslim follow a conservative interpretation of Islam. The official position of many Afghan religious leaders does not reflect the interpretation of all Afghan people, especially when they come here. For example, not all Afghan women wear um, uh, a job living in the United States or in other Western countries. Do not push an Afghan to tell you about their family. Some people have separated from relatives or had family members killed. Others may, may be hesitant to talk about the family that they have left in Afghanistan out of fear that it could endanger them. They will not talk about their extended family members here either. Because as I said before, it could be their stepmother, it could be 
that their parents are uh, first cousins. Use a person's last name and title when reading them unless they permit you to move on to a first name basis. Um, if somebody uh, has a title of doctor, just call him doctor so-and-so. Afghan names traditionally consist of first name, personal name alone, without a middle name or surname. The language people use to address an, uh, one another varies depending on their age difference status in relationship. For example, men that are the same age brackets generally refers to each other as brother and act quite informally. Meanwhile, those who are clearly older than oneself are treated with utmost respect. The use of middle name and surname is not customary in Afghanistan. However, many who have contact with the Western world may adopt a surname. This is more common among educated or wealthy families living in urban areas in Afghanistan. The lack of standardization of spelling and combined with a high level of illiteracy means there are many discrepancies in the transcription of Afghan names into English. You'll see that if, if for a lot of your students when they come in from Afghanistan here. In Afghanistan, one should not touch people of the opposite gender unless they're very close family or friends. Leave the door open if talking one on one with an Afghan of the opposite gender. Ask an Afghan permission before taking their pictures, especially the women and girls. It's rude to walk away from someone while they're still talking. Both men and women should dress modestly when visiting an Afghan woman. Afghan houses. Uh, Afghans people generally extend an offer multiple times. It's expected that you politely decline the gesture initially before accepting it on the, on the third um, offer. This exchange is polite as the insistence to extend the invitation shows hospitality and initial refusal to accept shows humbleness and that uh, one is not greedy. Be sure to um, offer everything multiple times in return. If you only offer something once, an Afghan person may respond, no, it's okay out of modesty and politeness, even though they meant to accept on the second offer. Be careful when you um, compliment an item in an Afghan's house, as they may feel compelled to offer, you, of, offer it to you as a gift. Um, if they me. try to give you, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, five minutes? Yes, two minutes. Two minutes, great. Okay. Offer it to you, insist that you appreciate their gestures, but do not want to take it. Afghan takes great pride in their hospitality. It's considered an honor to host guests. They usually offer the best of things that they have to, to, to their guests. When you visit the Afghan house, normally you remove your shoes and, and just wait to be led through the house and shown where to sit. Um, and as I indicated, Oftentimes, men and women are separated. Men socialize in one room and women in another room. Um, but maybe some of them are changing their custom when they come here. It's customary to be offered tea and sweets as refreshment. And you've all heard of that, uh, the cup of tea, that book was written a couple of years ago. It's uh, very important to accept any refreshments, especially coffee and tea, is a mark of friendship. Non-acceptance would be perceived as highly offensive and could create a misunderstanding, even if you're simply not thirsty. They keep um, adding tea to your uh, cup uh, unless you indicate that you had enough or put your hand on top of the, the cup. Um, guests are always uh, um, offered the best of everything I indicated, even if they're poor families, they go to a great length to welcome people. Do not offer food uh, to Afghans during my, uh, fasting month of Ramadan. And gifts could be given to Afghan upon visiting the, someone's home for the first time. Uh, but do not give, give them alcohol as a gift, to a, especially to a devout Muslim or any Afghan. You don't have much of a close personal relationship. There are two main religious festivals 
the Eid al Kabr, your Eid al Qurban, the great feast or feast of the victim, commemorates the sacrifice of Abraham at the end of the annual period of pilgrimage to Mecca. Most families play a sheep and distribute, of course, they can't do that here, but they do buy a lot of meat and distribute some to, to friends and family and neighbors and also to some poor people. And then the other one is the Eid al-Fetr or Eid al-Ramazan. The small feast or feast of Ramazan marks the end of a fasting month and it's a period of cheer during which relatives and friends visit each other. The fasting month of Ramazan is an important religious and social event during both holidays. Um, elders give money or gifts to youngsters and people normally wear um, new colorful clothes and play wonderful music. Um, so. Um, also during the Muharram, that's the first month of the Islamic lunar calendar, the Shia commemorates the death of the grandson of Prophet Muhammad. It's a period of mourning and sorrow. Other important social ceremonies with a religious dimension include births, weddings, funerals, circumcisions of young boys, and charity meals offered by the wealthy people. The most Festive holiday celebrated by Afghans and Iranians is Nowruz, the New Year celebration, which occurs on March 21st, the vernal equinox, literally meaning new day. Nowruz is celebrated with picnics like our cookouts. The festival has its roots in terrestrialism, a religion brought from Persia long before the rise of Islam. I, I think I covered quite a bit, and maybe I left quite a bit. So I thank you so much again for the opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Erika. Thank you for having me. It's a, such a huge honor for me to be here. And thank you, Dr. Hanifi and Mr. Vaughn for your amazing talks. And as I introduced, I'm from Afghanistan. I have spent most of my life in Afghanistan. I had to leave Afghanistan when I was 15 years old. So um, I and my family went to Turkey and lived there for four years. So, and we moved here last year. So, and I went to Kalina High School. So it, it was, well, to be honest, it was very hard and challenging to leave my country at first place and start living in a completely different country with a different language and culture. And in the most of the cases, it's not just about language and culture, but also mental health. Uh, I remember my first day school at the Kalina High School. I was so nervous. I was worried about my classes, about my transcripts, about how I can pass the classes, how I can be successful. So basically, I started school with a lot of confusion and questions. Uh, it was so hard for me to figure out the education system here at first because it is completely different from the system I was familiar with in, an Afga in Afghanistan and Turkey. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same for upcoming students. Um, there was a lot to learn about education system and also a lot to accept. Um, I mean, totally different experience. It was totally different experience. And I had to learn a lot of things. Uh, for example, like very basic things like technology, uh, there was like a bunch of different platforms like clever digital books that I'm pretty sure that our instructors are very familiar with it. Uh, there, uh, so I, that I had to get familiar with all those and it was not that easy to change my learning style at first because I was familiar with the printed books, with the highlighters and like with the in-person quizzes, like not in computers. So it was like definitely a huge transition. Um, also, but I think as uh, Mr. Wan mentioned, the biggest problem at first is language. Uh, the learning process is very challenging and very tiring. I knew a little bit English when I came here, but it was still very difficult to find the courage to speak. Also, uh, we are learning British English in high schools, like in Afghanistan and Turkey. So the words that we learned, uh, like I had learned in the school were completely different. So it was like, I had to learn English, like very basic. So uh, with that little English and pandemic, online learning, all that stuff, 
it was almost impossible. It was almost impossible for me to find friends or like kind of build a community. So, and uh, I wasn't my senior year when I got here. So I was very, very concerned about um, my credits, about my transcripts, about like after life after high school, as I was like in my last year and I didn't know anything. So. Uh, I remember crying most days. I remember arguing with my parents about like why we came here. Like I was like with them. Now I can go to university. I was like, I don't know anything. I can't speak English. I was like, what will be my dream of being a doctor be like? So it was basically a period of depression and anxiety and stress for me at the beginning. Uh, I even had like very, not funny, but like different memories. Uh, I started like researching about college and about high school systems here. So I read an article about medical school. I read about the MCAT exam and I thought that I have to take the exam right after I graduated from high school. So I even started studying for it. I got more depressed. Like I was like, I cannot definitely be a doctor here because there was a lot of difficult topics and subjects and I didn't even know any of them. So they were like very confusion for me, but then I kind of start to explore my opportunities and talk with the uh, school counselor, our school counselor. She explained eventually everything. Uh, so one of important points here is that I didn't even know that the school has a college counselors, like our counselors are called. So I think it is very important to let your students know about all services that are available for them in school so they can take advantage of them. Because I personally never had a school counselor or advisor in my other high schools, so like my own schools uh, before. Then I kind of slowly start to get used to school and the system. My English got a little bit better, but I'm still learning. So I kind of start to find my way, but I was still very concerned about life after college as I told I was like senior. Then, uh, and I was very alone. It was like very online learning, but I didn't have like any friends to ask. It's, it's very like depressive uh, situation. So I kind of like talk with uh, my college advisor and my college uh, counselor at school. She helped me a lot. And uh, I find my way and like very basic things that it's not very hard for. Uh, maybe other students can be very hard for refugee students like myself. For example, like applying for college or like filling the application can be not that hard for other students maybe, but it was obviously very difficult and challenging for myself because I had a lot of um, transfer credits and I didn't know like how to put all those. So also I was like concerned about financial, about even transportation. So there's a lot of obstacles, I believe, in a journey of a young refugee, um, maybe rather than other students. So a lot of works for the students itself and for our amazing teachers. But the process can be very challenging and tiring for them. Um, and I think it's gonna be a lot more difficult for upcoming Afghan students because they do not have a transition period between Afghanistan and here. Because um, as I mentioned, I uh, lived in Turkey for four years with my family. So, and I learned a lot in Turkey. For example, I learned how to start learning the new language or like culture, how to accept the new culture. And I had my coping strategies, but it was still very difficult, but I, at least I had experience, but this is not the case for new students, I think. So I think there is a lot more work or like effort for our teachers in order to support them along this journey, because it's gonna be very confusing for them. Uh, and as Ms. Rowan mentioned, like schools are very, very different from there. Um, we have like very strict schools, so, and with limited opportunities. So here with a lot of opportunities and with a lot of classes, so they might be very confused. Uh, and uh, we had a very amazing pre-event asked question, uh, mostly about 
how to welcome Afghan refugees and how to support them. To be honest, that made me so happy to see how much you all care about your students and how much you are like aware that they do not have a bright past. So I would like to answer some of those questions. Uh, there was a lot of multiple questions about how to welcome new Afghan refugees in classrooms or districts. And I think based on my own experience and my sister's experience, I believe that the students will come very, very confused about everything. And I highly suggest if you are getting a group of Afghan students, introduce them to each other because they're going to be a resource for each other. They're going to be friends for each other. So it's really important to they know like other Afghan students in high school and like a uh, school. Um, and uh, uh, also, please explain at least a little bit about the school, about the schedule because uh, it was very confusing for myself. It's going to be a lot more difficult because they are coming in almost the end of the semester or the beginning of the next semester. So they are already behind of the curriculum, I believe. So let them know about available services and opportunities, especially if you have mental health services available in your schools. Um, uh, it's very unfortunate, but Afghans, like many other individuals from around the world, are very biased about mental health illnesses and mental health services. And I think it is very important for them to know that the services are available for them at least. Because um, they didn't have like a very good and bright past like background. So I think I myself need it. I think they also might need. Um, again, it will be very difficult for them to get used to everything, but I believe they are going to do it very good because um, they have studied and lived in a not very safe and supportive environment, but they still had the desire and resiliency to continue, like to continue their education. With that desire, I believe they will do great jobs here. So it's a matter of time for them to learn the language and kind of adapt to everything. But I believe that they wanna, they're going to do great jobs here. Um, also, there was a lot of questions about schools in Afghanistan. So before answering this question, I really want to mention that I studied in Kabul, Afghanistan. So it, my experience might be completely different from other students that studied like in other cities like Kandahar, maybe. Uh, so I can answer only on based on my own experience. But I can say that it's completely different from schools here. Uh, in general, there are no separate elementary, middle, and high schools. Uh, there are schools that have all those levels. Uh, every level has its own classrooms. I mean, like if there's like nine grade class and teachers are going to that class. So students are not changing classes, but teachers are changing classes. So this, uh, this might be really confusing for students. Uh, I remember get lo got lost like multiple times in high school. So please let them know that they have to change their classes. And um, uh, same level of students have exactly the same schedule, same classes. Uh, why I mentioned this, because here I know that we kind of can choose what kind of courses and what kind of classes we want to take. But in Afghanistan, we don't have like any opportunities. There's are li very limited opportunities. There's like very pre-made uh, schedules and students have to take all those classes. So I think this is very important for them to know that they have like a lot more opportunities. Like they have clubs here to join. They can um, maybe take music classes, art classes. So uh, that can be uh, confusing at first, but let them know that they have good opportunities here. And also questions about education quality. I believe uh, it depends on the schools because we have like very different schools with different uh, education qualities in Afghanistan. Usually, I mean, usually private schools have a better education than public schools, uh, but the curriculum uh, is usually the same in every school. We are getting all uh, about the same subject, like core subjects, like math, physics, geography, chemistry, biology, and English. And this is also important to mention that 
um, most of the times, um, I know like a lot of my Afghan friends here know this concept because we we learn a lot of things that, uh, in Afghanistan. So they know the concept, but they cannot elaborate it. Um, so this is also an important thing to keep in mind that in like language comes first before any other subjects. Um, and English, uh, almost all of the schools in Kabul um, teach English, but as I mentioned, it's going to be British English and uh, it's going to be very different. Uh, and I think students would probably know English, like a good background, but maybe not enough to speak in the first couple of months, like at the beginning. Also, Afghanistan has a separate girls and boys school. So it is very difficult, I believe, for them to study in a mixed school at first. Um, as uh, Ms. Rowan mentioned, I think in elementary schools, it's going to be not an issue, but in higher levels, yeah, it's going to be an issue at first. Um, they might still have a preference for separate schools or like for especially girls would like to be in girls' school. Um, other than that, I believe uh, they have the kind of a good um, like quality and uh, a good quality uh, education. Uh, but I was also I really want to mention this again. I studied in Kabul, but and it's going to be different for um, every uh, schools in Kabul and especially in other cities. Uh, so no matter what, I still think they will do great. And I'm pretty sure you all as instructors will support them along your journeys. And uh, if I have time, I can answer some more questions. And um, there was like a good questions about uh, how I learned English as a young English language learner and what research, resource and teaching learning strategies best helped me uh, to learn and understand, read and write English. So. I started learning English last year when I got here, and um, I totally believe that it is a matter of time. Um, I'm pretty sure that younger students gonna pick the language very quickly, but still, um, it's gonna be a matter of time uh, to practice, especially with speaking. Uh, and uh, as uh, Dr. Hanifi mentioned, uh, speaking and uh, Literacy can be very different. I was kind of literate about uh, in writing and reading, but uh, my biggest problem was speaking at first. So it's going to be different for every student, but I think uh, with practice, it's going to be very quick and easy for them. Especially if you can uh, match them. I'm, I'm not sure if if there's like any opportunity, like something like this in high, high schools or like high schools there, but if you can match them with a native speaker so they can practice their uh, English with them, it's going to be a great opportunity for them to practice. And also for uh, schools in Tucson, we have a great opportunity and a mentorship program called the uh, Refugee Youth Mentorship Program, uh, RYMP. Uh, I can write it down, but it's a great uh, opportunity for students to match with a mentor and they can practice their English and they can work on their goals. Uh, I just want to mention this resource because you can. Um, transfer this information to our students as well, uh, just to let them know that they have uh, available uh, um, opportunities. And also uh, there was a good question about how would I like to be welcomed and included in the US and uh, what kind of two can teachers do to help? Uh, I think uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I believe that uh, at first it's gonna be very difficult, but if there is uh, another Afghan refugee students in your school, so please introduce them to them because uh, they're going to be a great resource for them. I know when I got uh, when I entered the high school here, uh, there was uh, two other girl refugee students and they helped me a lot. They showed me how to use uh, the platforms that I mentioned, like Clever, um, digital uh, books, all that stuff. And uh, it's always um, difficult for a refugee students, especially like Afghan students, based on my own experience, to maybe ask for help because uh, we usually want to do it by ourselves or maybe we are shy, I'm not sure, but yeah. So if uh, uh, there is uh, another Afghan students that maybe had like a little bit more experience, uh, they can definitely help them 
and uh, they would be like very open to ask them uh, rather than maybe um, instructors or other students like native students and i believe uh, it's not uh, we I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have like pretty open minded teachers here at the us uh, but also it's i really want to mention that uh, it's going to be uh, very difficult for students but also they're going to be very uh, offended by other students like they would be very uh, they might think that they are very different they might be think that they are not enough they might be think they are less educated so please let them know that they are not different or just make them feel that they are not different they are just like other students um because i was when i entered high school uh i was like before uh, even before even entering the school i was like thinking i might be maybe the last person in the school uh, that does not speak english or uh, maybe i'm the only one that don't know the how to use the digital platforms so uh but there is like ald classes uh for uh, english learners in high schools or middle schools i believe uh, so this is a great opportunity, I believe, for students because they kind of have other, they're going to see other uh, refugee students, they can make connections. Because I remember I was feeling very good, like very uh, good in uh, my ILD classes because there was a lot of refugee students, other Afghan refugee students and, and other from other countries. Uh, but I was kind of uncomfortable in uh, other classes like my mixed classes uh, especially with the native speakers because they were speaking like really good english and i was uh, very um uh, was feeling bad because uh, obviously i cannot speak like them so it's a matter of time for them to learn the language and also uh, to know that they are not going to be native so it's, it's really important for them to understand this um because it takes it took time for me to understand uh, that I'm not native, I'm not going to be native. So it's okay if I miss the word, if it's, it's okay that I mispronounce the word. Because uh, at the first, they want to try to be best. I, at least I was like that. So, uh, and I, again, it's, it's a matter of time for them, but I'm going to, I think that they're going to do great because they are very resilient people. Um, also, there was uh, questions about, is there anything commonly done in youth classroom that make female Muslim Afghan students uncomfortable, like uh, certain activities and discussions? Uh, I think we kind of mentioned this before, but um, we have separate uh, high, uh, separate schools in Afghanistan, so it's very difficult, for, especially for female students to um, kind of adapt in a mixed school. Uh, and I think uh, not, make them very uncomfortable but maybe uh like activities that are involved opposite gender uh, one-on-one -on -one opposite gender interactions uh discussions uh i like myself i really don't want to talk about my past in a class like with my classmates i really don't want to talk about my experience in afghanistan um i had teachers that asked me these questions and i was really feeling bad because I really don't want to talk. Maybe I really accept and appreciate my past, but it doesn't mean that uh, I want to talk in front of my other classmates, right? So please don't ask them maybe their past or their background in front of their um, other classmates. Uh, that are things that I come in mind. Uh, other than that, uh, it's going to be individualized. Uh, uh, students, because they might have different uh, opinions and uh, different desires. Uh, but I think these are the common uh, things that can make a student, uh, and especially a female Muslim Afghan students. Uh, if the student is hijabi, if they were wearing hijab, um, so they don't want to, uh, really don't want to uh, interact with opposite uh, gender. So let's keep in mind this like uh, points. Um, and also there was a good question about how has Afghanistan's past impact its present and how what's the most important for students to understand about Afghan society? What are common misconceptions, uh, misconceptions that can be addressed? Um, I think uh, the past and present, unfortunately, is the same. We are still in a war. 
um, we still have all those obstacles. But uh, I think for, especially for a female student, there is a lot more obstacles. There is a lot more stereotypes uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, I think uh, it's important to kind of let the, your students know that uh, this is not case, in the case here because um, I mean, uh, I know myself in Afghanistan, I, men are always dangerous for us. But this is why we really wanna avoid all like mixed schools and uh, maybe one-on-one uh, interactions with opposite gender. So just maybe uh, again, as a matter of time for them to understand and realize that uh, this is not gonna hopefully, hopefully not gonna be the same um, as Afghanistan. Uh, and I think uh, misconceptions about Afghanistan. Uh, I think that we see a lot of bad news in Afghanistan through news and all this stuff, but uh, there is a still education in Afghanistan. I mean, it can be not as good as there, but uh, still education. Because uh, I remember when I started the high school here, my classmates were asking me, do you know like how to write? Did you go to high school before? Did you like do this? And it was like very uncomfortable questions for me because uh, I lived there and I was like, uh, yeah, we go, we go to school. We, I went to high school there even. We, I was like, especially exp uh, explaining all this stuff that um, there's still education in Afghanistan. Uh, so that might be a thing. Um, I think that was the questions for me, uh, like pre-event questions, but I'm open for any other questions. I, sorry, it was very short, but it, it was not as informative as uh, Dr. Hanifi's and uh, Ms. Rowan's talks, but this was all I have. I think it was actually very informative because